Hello guys, welcome to Learn Extra Live. It's Tuesday, so, no, it's not Tuesday, is it? Wednesday. Already. Wednesday. Guys, it's Wednesday. Move on with the times, Katao. It's Wednesday and it's Life Science. Guys, what an awesome Wednesday. I love Life Science. And today we have you again. How are you again? Good and you, Katleko. Good, good. What are we going to be doing today? Well, today we're looking at the human skeleton. And we're going to look at the different parts of the body, uh, the, uh, the skeletal, and we're going to look at some other skeletons as well. Awesome. And we're going to try and compare them and see why we're different and yet are quite similar. In quite the in same as yeah. well. That sounds really, really exciting. Of course, you guys know all about Learn Extra Live and you know that it's such an awesome show. We have an awesome jam-packed show. In fact, today, the Grade 12 show will be extended by 30 minutes, guys. That means from 7 to 7.30, you will get more fun. This is not for just Grade 12s, just by the way. This is for you Grade 10s and also Grade 11s and also your moms, your dads, your sisters, your brothers, your cats, your dogs, your grannies, your uncles, your chickens. Anything that you may have hidden in your house. You must tell them to join us from 7 to 7.30 because there will be an After Earth special, guys. This means that we will be doing lesson plans from After Earth. By now, you know After Earth, that movie with the awesome duo, Will Smith and Jaden Smith. I love them so much. And also, you need to stick with us because we will be showing you a clip of that as well. So we'll be doing lesson plans. And also, we will be crossing over to Macmillan where they will be launching their digital, guys, listen up, digital, digital ebooks. We'll be crossing over to them live on Skype and we'll be chatting to them. It's going to be really, really awesome. So join us on Facebook. This is where you can keep updated, up to scratch, where you can get fast links for your notes, anything that you need, guys. You need to jump over to Facebook or Twitter and I'll be updating you. That means that you guys need to pay me back by actually asking questions. Anything that you may need, guys, on the human skeleton, after earth, anything, I am here for you all the way. Over to you again. Thanks, Katleko. So, folks, welcome again to Wednesday's edition of Life Sciences, Great Tense. Let's, uh, let's look at what we've done in the last week. So last week we looked at the parts with different types of skeletons. We looked at endoskeletons, we looked at exoskeletons, and we looked at the hydrostatic skeletons. And I did mention that today we're going to look at the human skeleton, and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to look at the structure of the human skeleton. We're going to look at the different parts, and we're also going to look at some other skeleton types, and maybe not entire skeletons, but we're going to look at parts of them, and we're going to look at similarities between them and the structure for human skeleton. So let's get busy with the lesson. So when we look at this lesson, we're going to discuss important terminology. And all, as I always say, term terminology is very important. We're also going to look at the axial and the appendicular skeleton. We're going to look at how the skeleton is divided into the axis and the appendages that are attached onto the axis. We're going to discuss the functions of the skeleton, very importantly, we should understand the different parts and their functions and how they adapted to perform their functions. And finally, we're going to work through some revision questions right towards the end. So let's move on to some important terminology that uh, we will come across and we've come across in the last lesson as well as the previous lessons. So appendicular skeleton, guys. The word appendicular refers to appendages. So obviously this refers to the appendages attached onto the skeletal system. The axis refers to a long vertical line along which the body uh, is uh, divided into left and right hemis uh, sides. And so we're going to look at what the axis is. The cranium, we're going to look at the structure of the cranium and how it's made up. We're gonna, we've discussed chitin last week. We spoke about how some skeletons have lots of chitin in them, especially animals that have an exoskeleton. We're gonna look, we've discussed endoskeletons last week. We said that endoskeletons are skeletal systems that are within the body. Exoskeletons typically found in animals that have an exterior body covering. We're going to look at ligaments and tendons over the next week when we discuss uh, joints, movement, and ligaments. Uh, we're going to look at the girdles today. We have two types of girdles, the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdles, and you need to constantly refer to these terms as you go through your notes. Uh, we're going to refer to the thorax or the rib cage. Uh, we're going to talk about the sternum, the breastbone, uh, we're going to look at the structure of the vertebral column and what it's made up of, so, and these are the vertebrae. I've not mentioned the specific bones in details. So we're going to discuss these as we go through. So very, very quickly, we let's look at the structure of the human skeleton. Now, now obviously, here we've got lots of, uh, lots of bones in this diagram, but I've, I've, I've actually brought a friend today, Mr. Bones. We've got, a, we've got him with us in the studio, and he's going to join us for a lesson. Uh, 
and we're going to look at the different bones as well. So very, very quickly, we can look at the human skeleton and we can divide it into two sections. We talk of the axis, that's the vertical plane along which the body is divided, and we talk about the appendages, which are these structures. So we have the appendages along which, which are attached onto the main axis. So, so what is the axis made up of? The axis is made up of the skull, the vertebral column right here, and the thorax or the rib cage. When we look at the appendages, we refer to the appendages, would refer to the parts that, are, that the are attached onto the axis. So it'll be the girdles, it'll be your limbs, your forelimbs, it'll be the pec pelvic girdle, as well as your hind limbs. So we're going to look at the structure of each of these different parts and uh, the structure of the vertebral column in detail as we go through the lesson. Okay, so when we talk of the human skeleton, we refer to the humans as having an endoskeleton, that is a skeletal system that is made up of bones found internally. Humans have their skeleton made up of hard bones. Unlike certain other organisms that have a soft endoskeleton, and we spoke about sharks last week when we said that they have their skeleton made up largely of cartilage, which is much softer, which makes them, gives them more flexibility and allows them buoyancy in water. Human skeletons are much harder. They're made up of bone, and if you know that bone has got lots of phosphate, calcium in it, and that is what strengthens the bone. In the, bo in the body, we, ne we obviously need to know some ca unique characteristics. The, the longest bone <laughs> is the thigh bone, which is the femur. And by the way, the smallest bones. Katlika, which would be the smallest bones in the body? Um, just a guess. Just a wild guess. I don't know. Do you want to tell me? Uh, you probably heard about it before. Um, another clue? Um, is it on the feet, maybe? You've heard about it before. Uh, is it on the feet? No, no, no. Is it in the... The ears. Ears. Yeah, absolutely. That's it, ears. Yes, and these bones actually don't grow from the time you're born. So there are three bones in the, m in the, in the inner ear, the mm -hmm. hammer anvil stirrup, the malleus inca stapes, and these bones remain uh, uh, in, the in that size from the time you're born, and hence they refer to as probably the smallest bones, of which the stirrup oh, wow. is so the smallest bone. So they do not bone. grow, so they if you're born with them, you die with them. Yep, and they don't change in size, and they play a very important role in, yeah. not necessarily in the support, but in the amplification of sound. So that's, that's a good interesting point for us to take forward. Most mammals move on four legs, so we refer to them as quadrupeds. Humans are bipedal. Uh, bipedal would basically refer to any organism that stands on two feet upright. Uh, and this transition from being quadrupeds to bipedal is very important. Uh, there are unique characteristics that bipedal organisms show. We're going to look at those characteristics and how we can talk, how we can decide just by looking at the structure of the skeleton whether an organism stood upright or whether it walked on all four limbs. So we're going to discuss that in great detail. Bipedal simply means they stand upright on two legs. And they usually they have these two legs that they use for locomotion, which frees up their upper arms so that they freely can use these arms either to, to carry things, to swing on branches, to be able to lift, or to be able to manipulate the food that they eat. So it's very important to be able to, to make the call and see the difference between an organism standing on, all two uh, standing on two feet as compared to an organism that walks on all four. Uh, very, very quickly, we spoke about this early on. The human skeleton consists of two parts. It's the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. When we talk about the axial skeleton, it's made up of the skull, the vertebral column, and the rib cage. So we're going to look at the structure of the skull, the vertebral column, and the rib cage. We're also going to look at the appendages, and obviously that forms part of the appendicular skeleton. The appendages simply means parts that are attached onto the axial skeleton. And if we look at those parts, it would refer to the, the girdles, and we have two girdles. We have the pe pectoral girdle, so your shoulders, as well as your pelvic girdles, which are your hips, and we're going to look at the bones of the arms and the legs, or the forearms and the legs. So we're going to look at that in, in, in a bit of detail in a little while. Okay. So when we talk of the axial skeleton, we basically refer to the longitudinal line along which the body is divided into left and right halves. We looked at this, we're going to look at the skull, vertebral column, and the rib cage. Let's very quickly look at the skull. We're going to do a bit of theory before we actually look at some skulls and look at the structure of these skulls in detail. Okay, so I'm going to go through very quickly to an actual diagram. So when we look at the skull, 
we have the cranium. I'm going to change my color here for you guys so that it enhances your viewing. So we have the cranium, which is made up of eight bones, initially are movable, that eventually fuse together and form a solid structure. And this is what we call the brain, the, the cap that covers the brain case, this, the cranial cap. And obviously, these are movables initially, movable initially, but we'll chat about why they're movable and how they, that's possible. Then we have, we have two jaws. We have an upper jaw. And here you clearly see the upper jaw here. Okay. And we have the lower jaw, which is this here. We refer to them as mandibles and maxilla. And if you know that your lower jaw obviously is movable, the upper jaw is attached to the skull and hence it's immovable. On the lower jaw and the upper jaw are teeth that are situated, are fixed onto them, and these play a very important role. So we're going to very briefly look at the types of teeth. We're going to discuss the importance of having teeth and how by looking at the teeth uh, structure and formation, we can, we, can we can relate that to the type of animal, the type of feeding it does. So very quickly, um, so we can also refer to the uh, upper jaw as the maxilla and the lower jaw as the mandible, as we clearly stated here. Uh, a characteristic of most jaws, of human jaws, is, and I know Kutleko, this is something that she looks for in men, is the sharp cheekbone, the distinct cheekbone that we see. Am I right? Is that something that enhances... Um, well, isn't that just in anyone, not just men? But I think it's more prominent in, more prominent prominent in, in men. men. Oh so you okay. see this distinct cheekbone yes. here. And that cheekbone is called the zygomatic arch. Okay. And uh, it's very important as a grade 10 learner to understand the zygomatic arch and its importance and why it's not as pronounced in humans as it is in some other animals. So obviously the zygomatic arch is a prominent bone in the skull and it is there predominantly for the attachment of the jaw muscles. So the jaw muscles attach onto that. And often, often when you chew, you feel your muscles uh, aching, and that's because the muscles are actually attached onto the zygomatic arch. So we've got to remember the term zygomatic arch, uh, and this is a bone that actually is important in terms of providing support for the attachment of the strong jaw muscles. Uh, very important, very distinct in animals that are predators that actually have st strong lower jaws that can crush their, their prey. So we're going to look at that structure in detail, especially in grade 12. We go on to the, s the skull. We spoke about different types of teeth. We've got, four we've got basically three different types of teeth, incisors, canines, your molars, and your premolars, which are classified into one group. Now, obviously, your incisors are the ones that we clearly see. The ones are right in the front that are used for biting off small pieces of food, and that's what we use to bite off. Then we have the canines, the ones that stick out on the side, and these are used to tear and to bite food. So this is often what you see when a dog chases you. You see the canines coming out clearly, and that's obviously an indication of its, uh, the teeth that it will use to bite and to tear its meat, likewise with other predatory animals. If we look at the premolars and molars, we're going to look at the lower jaw and upper jaws of a ox, and we're going to see how distinct these bones are. They play a very important role in grinding food. Remember that these would be the predominant bones uh, or teeth in animals that are herbivores that chew lots of their food. So we have, we have all these teeth, but we have uh, our canines are not as developed as or not as pronounced or prominent as an animal that is a predator. We've got premolars and molars, which are very strong and clearly distinct from other teeth, and that's because we spend lots of time chewing and grinding our food before we physically, uh, that's physical digestion, before we actually uh, swallow them and for the chemical process of, uh, chemi and for chemical digestion. Our incisors play a very important role in us biting food. We'll see how the incisors in animals, in other animals, play a very important role for their mode of nutrition and their habitat and lifestyle. Uh, the vertebral column, guys, very important, and often we're going to look at the structure of the vertebral column when we look at Mr. Bones, but I'm going to very quickly talk about the structure of it and its shape. When we look at the structure of the vertebral column, it starts off, it basically has, and I'm not too sure if you guys probably done this, but it's got 33 vertebrae. And if we look at this, we've got, we can divide it into five regions. We have the cervical region, that's the region around the neck, and this is made up of seven vertebrae. The first two are called the 
atlas and the axis. And these are the two vertebrae that allow for the movement of your neck in a plane that allows in a plane that allows for rotation of your neck. So very important. We can look at the structure of an atlas vertebrae and we see why a movement is brought about along a rotational plane. We then have your other five cervical vertebrae. And when we look at this, we see that the neural arches or the spines at the back, especially in your cervical region, are not as prominent as the thoracic and the lumbar region. So if you think about the muscles in the neck as compared to the muscles in the back and the lower back, the, your upper back and your lower back, they're not, as pro they're not as prominent. And the reason why they're not is because the muscles that are needed in the lower back and the lumbar region are stronger, they're bigger, and they're needed for bringing about movement and flexibility. The next region is made up of 12 vertebrae. It's called the thoracic vertebrae. And these are basically vertebrae onto which the rib cage or the ribs attach onto. And these play a very important role in bringing about protection to the internal delicate organs. So we've looked at the vertebral column. We've gone through very fast. We're gonna, I'm going to hand you over to Katleko before, uh, and we're going to go into a break. Thank you again. So guys, we're going to go for a break. During this break, I urge you guys to stay in your seats because the After Earth clip will be playing, guys. So just stay in your seats, watch it with everyone in your household, call their mom, come over, sit down, watch this After Earth clip, and afterwards, I'll be telling you much, much more about it. Okay, see you just now. Welcome back, guys. Of course, of course, you saw William Smith and Jaden Smith. Aren't they really, really awesome? You guys, really, we need to look after this earth. And also, we need to win tickets so that we can go watch this movie, so that we can see how we look after this earth or what will happen if we don't look after this earth. So you guys know the competition that is on right now that you stand a chance to win two double tickets, guys. Two double tickets to watch the After Earth like movie. Isn't that awesome? You can take me if you want, really, because I really want to see it. So the code word that you guys need to go onto the site, which is on Facebook right now, and let me tell it to you, www.learnextra.co.za forward slash after earth. If you go onto the site, you type the code word, which I'll be giving to you, and I'll be posting it for you on Facebook. So guys, if you're not on Facebook right now, please get those fingers working, get those fingers working so that you can jump onto the page so that you can enter the competition. Now that code word is geological, guys. Geological. This can get you, like, guys, you again, don't you want to really go watch this movie? I wouldn't mind now. Huh? I, I really want to. I'm going to go. I'm going to go as well, especially if you guys invite me, then I'm definitely going to go. So you guys have the code word. You guys know where to enter that competition. Jump on and enter it right now as we speak, guys. Over to you again. Thanks, Katleko. Guys, I'm sure it's going to be an awesome movie. And I believe, I believe you, um, you're going to enjoy it. It's also going to be relative, especially for your grade 10 year, especially when you get towards the end of the the year when we talk about ecosystems, biodiversity, the effect that humans have had on the earth, I think you're going to be able to relate to that, that movie and be able to see the importance of looking after earth. Kay. So before we went on to the break, we looked at, we were looking at the vertebral column. We spoke about the thoracic vertebrae to now we can just look at the other areas. We've got five lumbar vertebrae and these are probably the stronger verte strongest vertebrae along the vertebral column. If you look at this region, guys, they're prominent very prominent vertebrae. They have a large centrum. We're going to look at the centrum in a little while. The last two regions are called the sacral and the coccyx or the coccygeal region. Basically, the sacral are the last bones that are five bones that are fused together, and that forms the tail. And we have the coccyx, which basically are the last four bones which actually end uh, in the pubic region. So we're going to move on to the. St we can look at the rib cage in detail. Uh, we're going to very quickly talk about the types of ribs and uh, the number of ribs. So we have, basically, we have 12 ribs, 12 pairs of ribs. We have a central sternum, if you look around here, which is cartilaginous. It's not bone. And it's also called the breastplate. 
we have 12 pairs of ribs and the ribs are highlighted and clearly numbered so that's number one two three four five six seven the first seven pairs of ribs are called true ribs and the reason why they're called true ribs is because they have a direct attachment onto the sternum the next three pairs of ribs pair number eight nine and ten are called false ribs because these are attached to other ribs and that then attaches onto the sternum so the mode of attachment is not directly onto the sternum they indirectly attached along with other ribs and then they attach onto the sternum so we refer to these as false ribs by no means that they're not ribs it's just that their attachment is indirect they attach together with other ribs as you would see here and then onto the sternum and then we have our 12th pair which is a pair of floating ribs and these floating ribs basically are the ribs that are not attached to the sternum in any way so you clearly see them here these are your floating ribs and they don't have any direct attachment onto the sternum you often find that sportsmen uh, especially rugby players easily uh, fracture or break these ribs and it's because they don't have an immediate uh, attachment onto the sternum I know that some models as well could like you might uh, confer this uh, in terms <laughs> of to reduce their waistline yes, yes. they actually have that surgically removed, removed. Uh, so it is a procedure that's done uh, some of the learners may ask why is it there does it have a function and and if we look at ev from an evolution point of view these ribs have actually uh, gradually lost their function we've our ancestors or animals that relied on them had lots of them we don't really need that now and hence they've lost their direct attachment onto the sternum so that's a bit of extension for you as well so if we move on to the appendicular skeleton we're very quickly going to look at these bones before we actually look at some of the bones on mr bones so we spoke about the the appendicular skeleton having two girdles we looked at the pectoral girdle and the pelvic girdle so the pelvic girdle this is a pelvic girdle of a female and a pelvic girdle of a male basically a girdle is made up of two halves we've got a left half and a right half and each half is made up of three bones an ilium an ischium and a pubis and these are the three bones that are fused together to form the left half so if you look at the ilium here guys here we see the ilium okay then we look at the ischium which is this bone here and then we look at the pubis, which is uh, what I've just labeled the pubis down right here. If we go all the way here, right in the middle there. Okay, so we've got three bones that make up each of these girdles. We're going to look at the comparisons between the female and the male in a little while. Uh, just go up to the, we're going to look at the, the forelimbs and the hind limbs. Uh, essentially, guys, you would, you would know these bones, but more important than not, we've got to understand why we do this and the continuity into grade 10, 11, and 12. Uh, we talk about in grade 10, uh, we look at the structure of the limbs, we look at the similarities between the bones in the upper arm and the lower arms, or the lower limbs, and they're quite similar, except that they're called differently. The reason why we need to understand the structure is so that we can apply this to e an extension topic in grade 11, when we talk about the similarities in the limbs structures of different, uh, different vertebra, vertebrate animals, uh, we look at the pentadactyl limb and we see how they're similar. So when we look at the upper arm, guys, we have the clavicle and the scapu scapula. The clavicle is basically the collarbone, and here we clearly see the collarbone, an S-shaped bone. We see the scapula, which is the shoulder blade, and that's the blade that's attached to the back of your bone, uh, of, your, of your back, and it allows for flexibility of your arms. And then we see the humerus here, and that is attached onto the pe pectoral girdle. The humerus guys often find it difficult to remember the, difference, the, the differences between the humerus and the femur. Remember the humerus is in the hand and H for hand and that's an easy way to remember the humerus. We also have the hinge joint. At the hinge joint we have two bones that form that hinge joint. We have the radius and the ulna and this is the forearms that are able to rotate and that's because of the radius and the ulna. The hand is made up of your carpals, and there are seven bones that make up the carpals. We have then the metacarpals that are the bones that make up the fingers, and then you have the phalanges, which are the tips of the fingers. So in all, we've got 
We've got carpals, metacarpals and phalanges in the arm, in the hand. We've got the ulna and radius in the forehand. We've got the humerus in the upper hand. And we have the clavicle, which is a shoulder blade, and the scapula. And these are bones of the forearm. When we compare these bones to the lower limb, we can see that we've got the pelvic girdle, which is here. We looked at the structure in a little while. We've got the femur, which is the longest bone in the body. And we've got an additional bone in the lower limb, which is called the kneecap. And that kneecap is also known as the patella. And that provides protection for the nerves in the knee. Uh, it's the hinge joint that actually causes move, allows for movement. In the lower limb, we've got the tibia and the fibula, which is similar to the radius and ulna in the hand. We've got seven tarsals, similar to the seven carpals. We've got metatarsals and phalanges. We've got 14 phalanges um, collectively. Okay, so we've looked at the structure of the skeleton. And we're now going to move on to, we're going to look at, we've got Mr. Bones. We're going to look at some of the structure. We're going to look at the cranium and some other uh, bones from other animals as well. So before we start, we spoke about the cranium uh, and that the, the, the skull was made up of, m of many different bones. Here, if we look at the cranium of a human skeleton, this is obviously Mr. Bones. We've just taken his skull off. And here we clearly see sutures or sort of little stitches. And this is an indication of bones that were initially movable. And as you would see here, here I've got a little enlarged model of it. And these bones, guys, if you, if you move these apart, and you clearly see sort of a very uh, serrated edge, and these all look like, they look like stitches, these bones at one stage were fused, or are fused, they become fused, but initially they were very, they were movable. And uh, the reason why they're movable is that, Katlika, would you be able to guess why they're movable? Um, during birth process. Yeah, so that the, so that the skull becomes smaller Absolutely. or compressed. And, and you notice that often parents talk about you know, being very gentle with babies. It's because these bones have not yet fused. Once these bones fuse, and that happens after about three or four years, these joints become immovable, and they're now known as os uh, sutures. So they play a very important role, and the reason why they're movable is important in the birth process. You'd see these typical sutures even in the skeleton, uh, the skulls of other animals as well. A very characteristic of the ability of, of these bones to move is to facilitate the, move, the birth process. Okay, so that's that. We also need to look at a very important structure which I've included in the notes, which is called the foramen magnum. And this is the, the hole at the base of the skull. If you look at the hole at the base of the skull, basically, this is what allows the the vertebral column to connect to the skull, and within the vertebral column is situated the spinal cord. So the spinal cord attaches to the brain, and it's protected within the vertebral column. And this little opening is called the foramen, refers to the opening, and obviously it's called magnum, which relates to the opening of the the the, the skull, which allows the vertebral column to enter. What is very important is also to understand the position of the foramen magnum in relation to the skull. I mentioned earlier on that we are bipedal, that means we stand up upright. The position of this foramen magnum is a significant uh, movement, a significant characteristic of human skeletons, skeletons or animals that stand upright. By looking at the position of this, we can tell whether the animal was bipedal or walked occasionally bipedal or was on all four. Now, I've got also the skull of, let's see, uh, we've got the skull of, mm, let's see, I'm going to try and see something that's a bit more clear. This is of an otter. Uh, and here you see, okay, we're going to look at the structure, but you look at the foramen magnum. This is, at the this is at the back of the skull. If you compare that to the human skull, I'm very quickly going to grab this. If we're going to compare the positions of here, we've got it at the base, and here we've got it at the back of the head. This will clearly indicate that this animal had the vertebral col column running along a horizontal axis, and hence the opening at the back of the brain. And this will tell you that at the base, the organism stood upright. It's very important for you to be able to make that decision or look at the structure to be able to make that conclusion. And uh, we will use this characteristic as we get into grade 10, 11, and 12, when we understand how organisms move from being uh, all walking on all four to becoming occasionally bipedal to being 
totally bipedal. So very important characteristic of the foramen magnum. Another characteristic we spoke about is the zygomatic arch. If you look at the zygomatic arch, basically the cheekbone, we see it's not as prominent as in some other animals. Uh, here we've got uh, a replica of a fossil of, this is Homo habilis, uh, and here you clearly see very, very prominent uh, zygomatic arches. Now, just by looking at the zygomatic arch, guys, if you compare the two, obviously there's a size difference, but in terms of it being more pronounced, you can clearly see a very pronounced zygomatic arch. And that actually tells us that this specimen, this, hu this form of uh, ancestral Homo uh, habilis, relied or ate a lot of meat, it relied on its strong jaws and it needed a, the attachment of strong muscles to be able to crush and uh, uh, process its food. So a distinct feature of animals showing the development of the lower jaw would be the presence of a pronounced zygomatic arch. We also see the raised eyebrow ridges, which we talk about in greater detail in grade 12. Okay, we spoke about the types of teeth. Here if we looked at, here you see in the otter, we're seeing very pronounced, these are your incisors, the teeth that are used for biting, and you know that otters tend to bite, and they would, and that's very important for them. But if you look at the molars and premolars, so these are much less pronounced, and obviously they need to have, uh, they need to be able to chew and process their food. So if you compare them to their incisors, they rely on the incisors for being able to bite, and they chew with their molars and premolars. If we compare that to the ox, which is very, very, very big, uh, we see that you don't clearly see, the incisors obviously have fallen off, but you see distinct molars and premolars. And the reason why they're bigger, and obviously because they spend lots of time chewing their food, uh, you see that these bones are much more pronounced, they're more, than, uh, they're more distinct as compared to your, these are your canines, and I'm not too sure if you're going to go and stand next to a cow and obviously entice it to bite <laughs> you, it's not because these bones are not going to be of any use to them. But definitely they play a very important role in chewing. Okay. We also spoke about the vertebral column. Here we've got the, and if we compare that to the vertebral column of a human, this would be, if I were to hold this upright, which would not be a good representation, uh, this organism would be that of an ox. You see the last, th these would be the lumbar region, and then we go on to the sacral region and the coccyx. But obviously they have a tail, so you find that the coccyx, the coccygeal bones, this continues into the tail, and they're able to move their tail. And here you see, we call this the neural spine, and we refer to these uh, the as the transverse processes. And these transverse processes are obviously there for the attachment of the muscles. The neural arch is there for the attachment of the, of the muscles onto the backbone. What you see here is the opening and the opening through which the spinal cord runs. So the spine runs through the uh, spinal opening and it is protected within that cavity. Uh, we also see, uh, I've got a little, another vertebrae, and here you can clearly see the transverse processes. And this, the body of the vertebrae is called the centrum, and it is the strength, it is the solid part of this that actually supports the weight of the animal. So the lumbar vertebrae in humans have a pronounced a bigger centrum, and that's because they support the mass of the body. We also see distinct processes for the attachment of the muscles in the, in the ribs. Here we see the neural arch. And if we compare that to the animals like uh, dinosaurs that have a distinct neural arch, and that was for the attachment of strong muscles in the back. We've n we don't really need that. It also offered them added support and protection in their back. Here we see articular facets, and by that I mean uh, surfaces which articulate with vertebrae that are in front and at the back. So these are facets onto which the vertebrae attach and they're able to bring about movement. Between the vertebrae are uh, intervertebral discs, guys, and these play a very important role in bringing about movement as well as absorbing the shock from mechanical movement. So that's a typical uh, vertebrae that we would see in a larger vertebrate. Here we've got, I've got a vertebrae and I spoke about the atlas and if we look at the atlas guys uh, no distinct neural spine and the reason why it's not distinct is because we can clearly rotate our necks and that's because a lack of that uh, the transverse processes are less pronounced we have a larger uh, opening a foramen 
and that's for the passage of the spinal cord through it. Uh, so these are the two, well, this is one of them. We have the atlas and the axis that collectively bring about the rotation of the neck. Uh, <coughs> let's see. We also have, also have in front of me is I've got the, the, last, uh, the last two regions of the vertebral column. We call that the sacral region and the coccyx. And lots of my learners ask me, so but why is, are these bones fused? Is that an indication that we once had a tail? And that's a possibility that we can infer based on the transitions and some similarities we see in other vertebrates. So obviously these bones have been fused, so which at one stage were a tail, which we've lost the function of. Uh, they've become fused together. And uh, so these are the five sacral, and you've got the four uh, coccyx bones in the coccygeal region. Uh, no neural spines, and obviously that's because uh, we don't have predominant muscles that need to move the tail as such. Uh, let's see. So the other bones that we're going to talk about is we're going to go back to, this is our friend Mr. Bones, and we refer to the skeleton as having an axis that's a vertical plane along which we found the skull, we found the thoracic or the, the rib cage, and we've got the girdles. If we turn around, guys, we can clearly see the pectoral girdle, which is made up of the triangular scapula, uh, and then you've got your clavicle, which is the collarbone here, and that's an S-shaped bone. Uh, in the glenoid cavity, we find the head of the femur rotating in there. You've got the radius, the ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals, and the phalanges. If we look at the lower body, we've got your pelvic girdle, girdle made up of the ilium, the ischium, and the pubis. And what is characteristic of the pubis would, would be during birth is that it has the ability to move apart slightly so that it can facilitate the process of birth. If we compare the pelvic girdles of males and females, we'll see that uh, there's a distinct difference in the shape of these. Females tend to have a more bucket-shaped pelvic girdle. Uh, the the coccyx region tends to be a bit further back and that's basically to facilitate the process of birth. We, in the lower legs, in the limbs, we see we've got the longus bone, which is the femur. We've got the patella, or the kneecap. We've got the tibia and the fibula. And we've got your tarsals, metatarsals, and your phalanges. So that's a very quick look at it. What I wanted to point out was the ribs. And we spoke about your true ribs. We also can see we've got your ribs that are called the false ribs, and that's because in clear see a point of attachment together, and these fuse then to the sternum, and here you see your floating ribs, which have no dike attachment to the sternum. Okay, uh, so we've looked at that. We're going to go in for a short break, and then when you come back, we're going <coughs> to look at some revision questions, which I think are very important to do. Awesome, thank you again. So guys, we are going to go for a quick break, quick break. During this break, please, please, please enter that competition, guys. Really, really, really. I know that you guys want to win those tickets, but to win them, you have to actually enter the competition. If you are on Facebook right now as we speak, you will see that I've posted everything that you need to know, guys. The code word, the site that you need to log on to to enter, Everything that you need to know, what After Earth is all about, everything is on Facebook, guys. And if you have any questions, please never fear, ask them during the break. See you just now. Welcome back, guys. As you know, we are doing life science, and today we're talking about the human skeleton. I also want to tell you guys about the career in Daba that's going to be happening from the 20th to the 22nd of June. This is going to be happening at the Santon Convention Center. What you guys need to do is that you need to register on um, www www.careerindaba.co.za so that you can attend and attend when you attend, you can actually be at 60, guys, over 60, actually, over 60 workshops that are going to be happening at the Santon Convention Center on that day. Also, we're going to be there. Mindset's going to be there. So make sure that you come over there and you meet the rest of your team. I know we are your team because we like being here for you and we're here for you 
days and days of the week. We're here doing Life Science and every other show. So you better make sure that you are there to attend all 60 workshops if you can. And we're going to be there to actually meet you and congratulate you if you've done so. Over to you again. Thanks, Hitleko. So guys, before we went into the break, we spoke about the distinct shapes between the male girdle and the female girdle. So here we've got two girdles. We're looking at them clearly marked male and female. And often you find that uh, pathology or forensic scientists, when they do come across m bodies that have been burnt or mutilated or that have been excava excavated, it's very difficult for them to be able to tell if it's male or female. So they rely on basically looking at the proportions of the girdles. They're looking at body structure. But if we looked at comparatively between two, we can clearly see there's distinct differences between the shapes of these girdles. So when we look at a female girdle and compare that to a male girdle, we can clearly see that they have a larger, more bucket-shaped ilium. And that's obviously to be able to support the weight of the body, and especially so that uh, because of the birth process and females being cap able to reproduce and support the weight of their body, they have historically through evolution been able to support that weight by having a broader hip region or pelvic region. We also see the size of the the birth canal and compare that to the to the male. It's much narrower in the male and that's obviously here to facilitate the birth process. If we look at the size of the uh, if we look at the pubic arch here and we clearly see a less pronounced arch in females and if we compare that to males a very distinct uh, pubic or pelvic arch in the pubic region. Uh, let's go on to some functions of the human skeleton. Okay, so and we got to sort of be able to know at least four or five of these which could come in, in, a, in a typical question. So, first of all, we need a skeleton for movement and that is brought about by bones and muscles which actually bring about lo locomotion. Uh, it plays a very important role and we saw Last week we spoke about the functions of an endoskeleton and most importantly it provides protection. And protection to, the, to those delicate organs and de delicate parts. We saw that the skull has got a hard cranium that protects the brain. Uh, we also spoke about the rib cage protecting the heart and the lungs. And we see that it's very important in terms of protection. It also plays an important role in support. So it gives the body support, strength and more importantly it gives a shape uh, and that's how we have posture. It is also used as an organ of storage and especially for minerals and salts. Um, for mineral salts, you find that many animals rely on their bone structure for to supplement their body uh, for vitamins, minerals as well. Hearing. If we look at the human he uh, ear, we see that the smallest bones are found in the ear and these play a very important role, not necessarily for support, but I spoke about this in terms of amplification of sound, we saw that the ossicles of the middle here, the hammer, anvil, and stirrup, play a very important role in terms of amplifying sound. Formation. It is also a site for the formation of red blood cells. Most importantly, we're going to look at the structure of a, of a bone, a cross section of a bone, and longitudinal of a section of a bone next week. And we're going to look at the bone marrow. We've done this in connective tissue. We looked at the structure of bone, and we saw that bone marrow basically is the the center or site for the production of new cells and so we're going to look at very importantly the structure of the long bone. Let's look at some revision questions and that's very important for you to be able to provide. So I've put in some questions based on connective tissue, uh, animal tissues as well. So let's read. Choose the correct answer and write the correct letter corresponding to the correct answer in the table below. Failure to do so will result in you losing marks. So it's very important. You got to write only the letter and not the entire answer. So the bones of the hand are called. So we've got some options here and very quickly we're going to go through them. So off the hand guys, if we remember carpals, metacarpals, tarsals, t metatarsals. Okay, so your metatarsals would be in the limbs, your carpals, your tarsals, right. So it'll be the carpals. The phalanges are the ones in the fingers and we eliminate that. So we're going to look at the bones in the arms, in the hands are the carpals. Okay. Very the next question, which of the following joins bones to bones? And obviously we haven't done this today, but we're going to do this next week. Uh, we have two distinct, we have tendons and ligaments. And often learners are confused between the difference between a tendon and ligament. 
<coughs> so if you think about what a tendon does, a tendon basically will join your muscle to a, mu to a bone and your lig uh, sorry, your tendons join your bones to bones and your ligaments will join your muscle to a bone. So the following join bones to bones, the answer would be a tendon as a ligament will join a bone and muscle. Okay, we will do this next week. Okay, let's move on to, we're going to go on to the fourth question. A disease that causes the cartilage to wear away at the joints results I resulted in Mr. Lamson having hip replacement. So I have a colleague of mine who actually went in for hip replacement last week and last year, and this is exactly what they did for him. So they actually have replaced they put in a metal pin in here, which replaced the, the epiphysis of the uh, femur. And that you can clearly see it's screwed onto the, uh, acet the uh, acetabulum. The sorry, it's the glenoid cavity in which this fits in. So the question is, uh, let's see, the disease that causes this cartilage to wear off. So is it osteoporosis, arthritis, old age, or osteoarthritis? Now, Mr. Lamson's quite old, so, but I don't think it's old age. It's something that can happen uh, even to people in their late 40s as well, so I wouldn't regard that as being old. So that's an example of osteoporosis. So, and he's, he had a surgery done, and obviously he's recovered from it, and it's amazing how surgery of this nature can replace damaged tissue and even bone. Okay, so we're going to very quickly look at some multiple choice questions before we wrap up. Okay, so... Let's see, a skeleton made up of fluid-filled cavity, and we did this last week, and that'll be a hydrostatic skeleton. The skeleton that consists of two girdles and their associated limbs. So we know that we've done that today, and that'll be an endoskeleton. Okay, a disease caused by a lack of vitamin D, and that we just discussed, so that'll be osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Okay. The next question. The vertebrae found in the upper back. So the upper back will be the lumbar regions. Okay. The head of the long bone, guys, and we call that the head of the long bone is called the epiphysis. Epiphysis. The type of joint that is unable to move a type of joint. So these would be the sutures, and these would be found in the cranium. So these are immovable joints, the sutures of the cranium. The end of the muscle that is attached to the point that can move, and that's called the, well, when we do this, it's called the, uh, sorry, it's called the point of insertion. Okay, so it's called the point of insertion. Okay. A medical doctor who specializes in the injuries of the skeleton. Yeah, not too sure if you guys know, they're different specialists, and so obviously that's an orthopedic surgeon, and he will specialize in that. Okay, so let's move on to a question that relates to what we're doing now. In the space below, draw a table that compares the advantages of an exoskeleton and an endoskeleton. You need to give two ad advantages of this. So it's a tabulation, guys. We've done this last week. You should be able to put this together and tabulate the differences, uh, looking at the advantages of the exoskeleton and comparing them to the endoskeleton. And I've obviously got another question here at the end, which I want you guys to do. Uh, download these notes and refer to them. They're quite excellent revision questions to work with. Here we've got the skeleton, and we asked to provide labels for different parts. And very quickly, look at the parts and label them, and then we move on to some other questions. So. I might not have time to go through this, but obviously you guys have access to these notes. You can download them. Uh, I'm going to chat to you next week. I'm going to hand you over to Katleko. Okay, so we have a question. Um, this question is by... Sorry, my computer is having problems today. Okay. Um, okay, so this question is by Daniel. He asks, so the structure of female and male skeleton... Okay, the structure of the female and the male skeleton, it does, not look, it does not look the same because of the pelvic girdle. So I think he's asking, is 
The structure of the skeletons don't look the same as this because of the pelvic girdle in each of the skeletons. He's quite right. Uh, we can infer that they're distinctly different, and that's not the reason why they looked only different, but definitely the size of the girdle are different. The we looked at the pubic bones, we looked at the pubic symphysis, and even the, the size of the ilium. Awesome. So they're definitely different. Awesome. Thank cool you guys. very much again. Thank you guys for joining us today. But before that, I need to announce an awesome, awesome winner of the two After Earth tickets, guys. This winner is Silo Kobo. Silo Kobo, I hope you're watching because you've just won two tickets to go see After Earth. I'm so excited for you. I hope that you really, really enjoy it. From us at Mindset today, guys, we wish you all the best. Keep learning hard. Keep studying hard. Learn more. Learn extra. Remember that always. See you guys next time. Remember to join us at 7 for more, more, learn extra. Cheers, guys.